Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS, uh, as you might better know it. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Alex Lieber and I'm your guest MC. Uh, I'm a tobacco control researcher at Georgetown University. TOPS is being organized by Catherine McLean from Temple University, C. Shang from The Ohio State University, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, and Justin White from the University of California at San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org, the TOPS website, for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud on the webinar today. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, again, tobaccopolicy.org. Now, I will turn over the presentation to today's moderator, Catherine McLean from Temple University to introduce our speaker. Catherine. Today, uh, Dr. Rahi Abouk will lead a single paper presentation entitled, Examining Early Effects of Tobacco 21 on Substance Use Among Teenagers. Dr. Abouk is an Associate Professor of Economics at William Patterson University. He is also the Director of the Canvas Research Institute at that university. Dr. Abouk's area of research is the economics of substance abuse and drug policy. In his research, he investigates the impact of environmental health shocks, such as school shootings and policies related to smoking, vaping, cannabis use, and opioids on health outcomes among the general population, infants, adolescents, pregnant women, and the elderly. Mike Pesco is a co-author on the paper and will assist in answering select Q&As. Our discussant today is Si Shang from The Ohio State University. Dr. Book will be presenting his research in three segments. We will have pauses after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Book, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work today here. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, a joint paper by Prabal D and Mike Pesco on examining the early effect of uh, tobacco 21 on substance use among <clears throat> teenagers. So first of all, I have to mention that my, Dr. Pesco has an R01 NIH grant on the topic, and we have no industry funding and no conflict of interest to declare. So a little background and motivation on the topic of smoking and tobacco use. Uh, we all know that smoking is uh, dangerous for health and uh, each year it kills about half a million of Americans. Uh, the early signs of heart disease are found in young smokers. Also, there are some chance of some other diseases, other conditions such as cancer. So look, based on a Surgeon General report, 96% of smokers begin smoking before the age of 21. This number is about 85% for the age of 18. Uh, this would suggest that raising the minimum legal sales age to 21 would cover the larger portion of the population of the future smokers and potentially could be beneficial to public health. But uh, raising the minimum legal sales age to 21 would increase the monetary cost of purchasing tobacco, such as uh, hassle costs. It also could signal the users under the age of 21 that tobacco products are harmful, are harmful and associated with uh, basically uh, adverse health outcomes. Based on a report, published by the Institute of Medicine in 2015, uh, a nationwide T21 or Tobacco 21 law would result in about 250,000 fewer premature deaths and 50,000 fewer deaths from lung cancer by the year 2100. These estimates are based on the fact, basically, the other estimates that T21 would reduce the prevalence of smoking among the underage 
basically previously underage population, meaning that the age of those who are younger than 18, by about 25%. So these uh, predictions basically are very consistent with uh, the estimates that uh, applied researchers estimated recently on the effect of T21 in practice. So these um, uh, health estimates and estimates about the premature death and death from cancer are kind of very realistic and we can, are reliable. So in this research, we ask three main questions. The first question is that does raising minimum legal sales age to 21 reduce cigarette and e-cigarette use among the adolescents? And how does the effect vary by gender, race, and ethnicity? And if there is any unintended consequence, such as the spillover effects on marijuana and alcohol. So a little bit background about the history of minimum legal sales age in the US. So uh, the history is began by around late 1800s, 1880s, uh, when New York and New Jersey adopted policies to outlaw smoking sales of cigarette or tobacco products, let's say, to those who are younger than 16. So by 1920, about 14 states had T21 and eight other states had minimum legal sales age ranging from 14 to 20 four years of age. So between 1920 and 1980s and 1990s, uh, there were some attempts by tobacco companies to basically reduce this 21 minimum legal sales age and they reduced, they basically were successful and reduced the minimum legal sales age to, to 18 years. And by 1990, there were about 44 states and Washington DC that had minimum legal sales age of 18. However, early evidence suggests that these laws are in, very ineffective and additional studies suggest that it's probably because of weak enforcement that these laws are not uh, effective in reducing smoking. So therefore, after, uh, in mid 1990s, there was a series of attempts to enforce the minimum legal sales age laws. The first one was the 1992 Senate Amendment passing, passed by the Congress uh, to improve the enforcement. They required the states that are receiving block grant monies for substance use prevention and treatment to enforce the minimum legal sales age law and basically monitor the rate of compliance each year and report that basically. The second series of attempt was if it was the FDA retailers inspections done between 1997 and 1999. However, these inspections were discontinued because of the Supreme Court's rule in 2000, indicating that this is against law to conduct such inspections. Uh, however, after 2010, uh, under the Tobacco Control Act of 2009, these inspections were continued and FDA continued these inspections. Uh, there are two works on this topic, one done by myself and Scott Adams, 2017, and the second, the more recent studies by Bang and Mike Pesco. Uh, in these studies, we, we find basically, Abu and Adams find that uh, these inspections reduce the prevalence of smoking most uh, slightly among girls, but no effect were found among boys. However, Feng and Pesco extending the period of a study, they find a limited evidence and little evidence that there is any effect of retailer inspections on the prevalence of smoking. So all of these inspections basically, by the end of 2019, then we had a, a you know, federal T21 laws where it was enforcing the minimum legal sales age of 18. Uh, the T21 campaign launched in 1996 by Preventing Tobacco Addiction Foundation. And following that attempt, 
Needham, Massachusetts was the first city in the United States that adopted the policy in 2005. And since then, we had some additional cities, counties, and states adopting the policy, or better to say that adopting the law. Um, as of mid 2018, four states, including Hawaii, California, Oregon, and New Jersey, and around 281 cities and counties adopted the policy. Uh, this is about 30% uh, of US population. Uh, and 10 more states adopted the policy in 2019. Finally, in, at, in December 2019, we had a, a federal law under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act signed by the President Trump. This uh, map basically provides us with some information about the progression of the adoption of the T21 laws. As we see in 2014, we had only New York City and uh, some small cities in, in the state of Massachusetts um, adopting the policy and, and maybe one or two counties in Hawaii. In 2016, two statewide T21 laws were, were adopted in California and Hawaii and some other local laws in uh, New Jersey, additional cities in Massachusetts, uh, Illinois, Ohio, uh, Missouri, and Kansas. And by mid-2018, we had four states adopting the policy, including uh, California, Oregon, New Jersey, and Ohio Hawaii, as I mentioned earlier, and some more localities across the nation. So we have a nice, basically, variation in the timing of the adoption of the T21. Uh, on the other hand, the campaign supports basically all nic nicotine products such as cigarettes and e-cigarettes, but they don't support really nicotine replacement products such as gums and patches. And they base focus uh, uh, carefully on enforcing the policy, enforcing the law, so there are some provisions for enforcement. And there is no preem preemption against uh, local authorities and local authorities could uh, set up, uh, adopt more stringent policies in this regard. Uh, and uh, ideally there is no, it doesn't include possession usage and per purchase penalties, which, which could probably lead to some additional other problem in the criminal justice environment. So uh, how's the, T21 enforcement, because as we, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the enforcement of the policy is, might be playing a significant role here to be in effect, in the effectiveness of the policy. Uh, there are some evidence, there's some peer reviewed evidence from the, from New York City under the 2014 sensible tobacco enforcement law retailers license were, revoke, were revoked or suspended if tobacco products are sold in, to individuals under the age of 21 two times in a three-year period so the law was clear, clearly specified and uh, the enforcement was really successful in new york city however there are some anecdotal evidence from uh, Cleveland suggesting that the police department or other agencies do not really enforce the policy. So um, there might be some variation, but uh, in major locations and in state-level state T21 uh, are being enforced really well. Uh, a little background overall, minimum legal sales age of, minimum, minimum legal sales age laws. Uh, specifically the ones which sets the minimum legal sales age at the age of 18. So overall, uh, the, the laws were effective except one case in Switzerland. Uh, York and Europe use a discounting method regression analysis and suggests that the, the law is effective in the United States. There are more recent studies on the minimum legal sales age for purchasing e-cigarettes. Uh, and uh, there are a series of studies on that topic uh, all suggest that these laws, re uh, do, yeah, so 
the ones that study the e-cigarette as an e-cigarette use and an, as an outcome suggest that e-cigarette use declines. And there are some uh, mixed literature on the topic suggesting that it might increase the consumption of cigarettes. There is one study by uh, myself and Scott Adams, 2017, suggesting that on a particular group of population, it might population of the underage, underage population, basically, it might lead to a, a reduction of cigarette use as well. So, Rahi, maybe we'll uh, take a look to see uh, any questions from the audience. I know Mike is sure. doing a fantastic job, uh, but we do have one question. Um, is there any robust data on the size of the effect of the T21 versus T18 on minors? minors below 18 using tobacco. Could you maybe speak to that? Um, there, the literature on T21, I would say, uh, it's, very, it's very consistent, suggesting a, a range of estimates between maybe 25% to 40% reduction uh, of smoking following the adoption of T21, which is very nice. This is from earlier studies that I'm going to be talking right from the, on this slide on Friedman's, Friedman and other, others 2019 work and Friedman and Wu 2020 paper <clears throat> and also other uh, complementary papers. But uh, I have no uh, exact estimate about the 18 t minimum legal sales of 18 laws uh, i have no I, I have i don't have any estimate in my on my, my on my mind so I, I have to check but i would guess it would be a little uh, the effect of t18 let's say is smaller than t21 that's what i think but i'm not i have to check thank you and see yeah, any to follow up on that because, uh, in my opinion, both T uh, for the age uh, 18 or below 18 uh, specifically, they are always treated uh, under the T18 versus T21. So is there any rationale you would think T21 works better? Because for the, the minor below 18, uh, regardless whether it's T21 or T18, they're not supposed to be able to purchase tobacco products. So, um, first of all, the time period of a study of these two policies are different. And uh, at those different times, we had different varying level of cigarette use. And also, given that T21 is more recent and the, these policies are being adopted in years that we had some additional options such as e-cigarettes, people might have an alternative option such as using e-cigarette instead of cigarettes. And that might basically be one of the reasons why we see larger impact of T21. Uh, on the other hand, uh, another reason is that when we limit the law at the age of 21, we cut the access of the underage population to the social market among uh, all high school students because we have most high maybe more than over 99 percent of high school uh, students are below the age of 21 while uh, they might be above the age of 18. so this uh, could be another reason why we see a larger impact for t21 compared to t18 Oh, great, thank you, Rahi. Uh, I think we have cleared out the Q and A. Um, please, members of the audience, please uh, send your questions in. But I think we'll allow the presentation to continue right now. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so, um, talking about prior re prior research on T twenty one, one of the early studies, early observational studies on this topic, is done by Friedman and co-authors, two thousand nineteen. They conduct an online survey among those between the age of 18 and 22 who had ever tried smoking or vaping. So this period of a, the period of a study on this analysis was in less than a year, I believe, in November 2016 to the first or the second quarter of 2017. And in this analysis, authors 
compare the smoking participation uh, between those between the age of 18 to 20 years old with those between 21 and 20 years old uh, in T21 localities compared to other localities. And the uh, authors find about 39% decline in the odds of recent and current established smoking. So this is this estimate, as, as I'll show later, this estimate is relatively comparable with the estimate that we get. So I, that's one of the reasons I say we, can, we have a consistent literature on this topic. Uh, the other estimate, which is more recent, done by Friedman and Wu, 2020, they considered the time period of 2011 to, to, through 2018, uh, so 2016, sorry, uh, from using data, Burfest data, Burfest smart sur survey, and considering those between the age of 18 to 20, living in metropolitan areas, and they find nearly about 30% or 3.1 percentage point decline in the odds of a current established smoking. So relatively consistent with the previous study. Um, additional study looks at the, uh, basically the supply side information, meaning that tax paid sales of cigarettes instead of looking at surveys asking about the cigarette use, cigarette use from respondents uh, and these uh, sales are related to uh, two states california and hawaii that adopted the policy at the state level and they find 13 to 18 percent decline in the ta in tax paid sales of cigarettes after these two states adopting the t21 policies uh, noting that this is the the total sales and the sales is not related to the population under the age of 21 so the, the total sales declined by about 13 to 18 uh, percent finally a more recent paper which is an nbr working paper done by brian and, and others 2021 i would say uh, considers the time period of 2009 through 2019 and studied the effect of T21 on uh, two groups of population, those between the age of 18 to 20 years old, uh, from evidence from Burfus, and those between 16 and 18 years of age from Youth Risky Behavior Survey. They use a difference in differences this uh, identification strategy or methodology, similar to what we use in this analysis. And they conclude uh, that the tobacco 21 reducing the effect, the reducing the smoking, vaping, marijuana use and alcohol use. So, and again, the estimates are pretty consistent with the existing literature. So that's, which is nice. Any questions, any comments? Well, I think Mike is again doing a great job of the chat. Yes. Um, I just have one quick question. Um, what was the period of the R01 um, that may be related to the funding of the project? I'm not exactly sure. This is the question that Mike, I think, should answer, so. I think so, too. Um, I think that there's another question about um, maybe if you could speak more about some of the magnitudes um, that you just covered, but maybe the, if you have any thoughts on. Yeah, uh, as I said, so sure, I'll be happy to talk about it. So as I said earlier, so the magnitudes, the earliest study by Friedman and others, 2019 estimated the about 35% to 40% decline. In, uh, in prevalence of smoking among the target group, basically those between the age of uh, 18 and 20. The second paper by Friedman and Wu estimated that the, the percentage decline was slightly lower. As I said, 3.1 percentage point decline and about 30 percent depend I, I wasn't able to figure out the baseline mean of smoking in this in the data 
but I would say it's about 30%. So it's slightly lower, but again, in the same range. And uh, in this analysis, we find about a 28.5 percentage decline, percent decline in uh, prevalence in the smoking, in the likelihood of smoking among, thir among in past 30 days. So mo most of the estimates are within the range of, I would say 25% to upper bound of 40%. So this is the range of estimates that we get in this literature, as far as I know. Great, thank you. Uh, I guess there's one comment here that's just um, from Don Kenkel. Um, asking if maybe some of these ma these magnitudes perhaps seem a bit large, uh, and if you can perhaps speak to whether those effect sizes are um, reasonable or what we would expect. So, uh, depending on the target population, the effect size might seem large, but uh, uh, another point that could increase our, uh, uh, basically, that could increase the reliability on these estimates is that uh, most, as most studies done on the topic uh, getting similar effect size, as I said, between 25 to 40. So I cannot uh, right now think about a particular reason why these estimates might, not, might be biased systematically in all of these studies. Uh, and, uh, but given that, uh, the social market to the underage population, those who were below the age of 18, fully uh, basically cut in the school environment, that might be a suggestion, that might be a reason that we see a very successful tobacco policy. And, and I, I should say the effect of T21 is even larger than the effect that we see due to increasing the tobacco tax in the past several years. As we know, the effect of the tobacco taxes are basically not that uh, really large, especially based on data during the past 10 to 15 years. But that it's very surprising and interesting that the effect of T21 is large. And this is the effect that we've seen almost all the studies on the topic. So. So far, we don't have any studies saying that, okay, the effect is about 5% or 10%. So the effect is above 20%, 25%. So that's what I That's great, thank that. you. Sorry, and just a, a clarifying question, uh, my mistake here. Uh, Don wants to clarify that his question was specifically about the LE study um, on the tax paid sales estimate, not the others. So. Uh, um, about the... Ali and others study, you mean? Yes, that just, the, yes, that was the, the, the estimate he was particularly focusing on. Um, uh, I, I, I really don't, I can't talk about that study, but uh, 13 to 18%, uh, 13 to 18% decline seems to be large, given that the data is for the full population. Uh, I have to go back and look at the design sure. of their study, but yeah, I can sure. answer this question probably after the talk and I can basically email great. Don about that. Thank that you. would be super. Thank you. Um, I think we can continue. Thanks very much. Sure. So in this study, uh, we use data from monitoring the future survey, uh, which is a nationally representative survey from 2012 to 2018. This survey approximately interviewed about 50,000 8th, 10th, and 12th grader students in, in about 420 public and private schools in the United States. It's being done from January to June of each year. And respondents answer to a wide variety of questions about smoking, vaping, drinking, and substance abuse, including um, opioid use and some other uh, measures. And also it has some core, very complete core questions on different topics such as maternal and pater parental education, uh, income, and so on. 
So in particular, in this study, we conduct uh, three separate analysis uh, on the following population groups. The first group we study is uh, eighth and 10th grader students. The second group is 12th grade, 12th graders under the age of 18. We call them under underage 12th graders. And we also consider those 12th graders who are 18 and older. In terms of variables that we use in this analysis, uh, as outcomes, we have six uh, variables related to cigarettes, cannabis, and alcohol, cigarettes, e-cigarettes, cannabis, and alcohol use. All of them are asking questions about use during the past 30 days. So we have cigarette use past 30 days, average daily cigarette smoke past 30 days. We have the a binary variable whether the respondent use any e-cigarettes during the past 30 days. Noting that this data is available for the period of 2014 to 2018 in, in the monitoring the future survey data. Uh, uh, we also look at the frequency of days using e-cigarette in the past 30 days. Uh, just a binary variable whether the respondent consumed cannabis during the past 30 days and alcohol. And the main policy variable, basically the T21 policy variable, is a binary variable equal to one. If a state, county, or city had a T21, law at the time of the interview and zero otherwise. So I should say here that at the contribution of, our, of this work is that given the flexibility in our data set, we are able to capture the effect of all different levels of T21s, meaning that the T21 is set at the state, county, and city level. So other studies were not that flexible in this matter and they either considered only uh, state uh, level T21, or uh, the, the, the study done by Friedman and Wu basically had the opportunity to look at the, um, at the metro, uh, metropolitan level data, but uh, uh, this study is more granular in this, uh, in this regard. Uh, our right-hand side variables are basically a set of individual level variables such as age in years, gender, dummies for race, and the weekly labor and non-labor income. Non-labor income basically is allowances from parents. And we have a series of binary categoric, we have, a, we have two categorical, categorical variables for parental education. We construct a series of binary variables whether the parent, mother or father is, has education uh, under high school, high school education, some college and grad, uh, um, college degree or higher. In terms of policy variables, uh, we control for cigarettes taxes at the city, county, state, and federal level. We control for beer taxes. We control for county level 100% smoke free air laws and county level vaping bans. We also control for a binary variable whether a locality or the state has any e cigarette taxes and also controlling for the e cigarette sales ban uh, to make sure that uh, these policies are not driving the results due to T21. The last policy variable is basically cannabis decriminalization law. Uh, it's a, a binary variable for cannabis decriminalization law, basically. And in terms of the model, we use a conventional difference in differences uh, and event study models. Uh, we also uh, use the Goodman-Bacon approach and partial out group-specific or area-specific linear pre-trends. Pre 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 so I, I'm gonna explain what, what I mean by area. 
So in, analysis, in our analysis, we basically look at the, we use a linear probability model. We weight using the monitoring the future sampling weights. We cluster our data at the, we cluster the standard error at area level. Uh, by area, I mean all non T21 states and states, counties, or cities with T21. For example, Chicago adopted the policy in, I believe, May 2016. So Chicago would be one area. The rest of the state of Illinois would be uh, an independent area. So that's the way we classify. But for the states like, let's say, Utah that had, didn't have any T21, so that would be one area. So that's, def that's the definition of the area in our data set, in our setting. Uh, we use the within area variation in T21 adopted in three states, uh, New Jersey, California, New Jersey, and Oregon, seven counties and eight cities. These uh, available, these data available in monitoring the future survey covers about 80% of the population of the areas under T21 in the US by mid 2018. So it's a pretty decent coverage of the policy in our survey, in, in the monitoring the future survey. So the equation is specifying our difference in difference model. Uh, we control for county dummies, uh, month year dummies, uh, set of policy variables introduced in the previous slides, and also individual level dummies. So the coefficient of interest is W, uh, and I have to mention that this equation is an extended version of a basic DID model. In a basic DID model, we have two groups, two time periods, before and after, and treated and controlled. However, in this case, we have more than two groups and two times period of treatment. So states or localities adopted T21 in any month in 2014, 15, 16, and 17 or 18. Therefore, we have to use a more flexible um, specification. Uh, so that's the, the way, that's the conventional method to basically uh, construct a difference in difference model in the economic literature. So a little bit of information about the Goodman-Bacon approach. Goodman-Bacon Goodman basically shows that any two-way fixed effect DID model could be specified as a weighted average of all possible two by two DID estimates, meaning that we have a general um, DID estimate. That estimate could be uh, decomposed into uh, basically a weighted average of all possible two by two basic, basic DID, as I mentioned previously. So two-way fixed effect DID estimates may be biased in presence of treatment heterogeneity. What do I mean by treatment heterogeneity? Meaning that we get um, varying estimated coefficient on the policy for each locality. That's basically defined as treatment heterogeneity. And the bias might be even bigger if the effect changes over time. So this literature is a growing literature in the field of policy evaluation in economics. And you can look at the Bacon Decomp uh, Stata Command, which calculates and plots the two by two DID weights. The, the, the Goodman-Bacon approach is mostly a diagnostic test approach in addressing the issue. Um, however, there are additional papers which basically provide some estimators, state-of-the-art estimators to tackle this issue. A paper by Callaway and Santa Ana and uh, Abraham and Son, and some other additional papers also available in the literature. Uh, note that we, to test the treatment heterogeneity in our case, I can, we conduct uh, two, two different tests, which I'm gonna explain later but to make sure that, uh, to make sure if we have treatment heterogeneity in our case. Oh, uh, Mahi, I'm sure. sorry to interrupt you. We just have a couple of questions from our panelists in the chat. Could I um, 
just ask you a couple of clarifying questions. Sure. Uh, I think that Jessica, uh, Jessica King has a question about whether there's any effort to account for variability within policies, whether it includes e-cigarettes or strength of, of violations. Um, about e-cigarettes, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, the policy usually covers e-cigarettes. So there is no uh, evidence suggesting that some localities exclude e-cigarettes from the list of uh, products that should be basically under the T21 laws. Uh, but in this analysis, we find limited evidence that T21, as I mentioned there later, uh, limited evidence suggesting that T21 affect e-secret smoking. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and Alex Lieber asks, uh, there were some sales bans that happened late in 2019. Um, so are you able to account for those? Our data period is by mid-2018, so I don't think our study basically reached the, those kind of policies in 2019, so I wouldn't really be worried about that issue at all. So. And I think Mike's doing a great job of clearing up the Q&A, so yeah, uh, thank, thanks so much. Thank you, Mike. So uh, talking about the summary statistics, this table provides information about the baseline statistics for the period of 2012 to 2013 uh, for two groups of this two population group, eighth and 10th graders and underage 12th graders. Um, and for each population group, we compare two groups of localities, non-adopters, and T21 areas. As we see, for both population groups, the rate of smoking is lower in the T21 laws. They also have more stringent tobacco policy. For example, the 70% of the population in T21 areas before the adoption of T21 were under 100% smoking bans and about 18% were under uh, vaping bans. These numbers in non-adopter, non-adopting non states uh, are basically about 30% and 2%. So, so clearly there is some more, uh, there is some stronger tobacco policy going on, adopt, being adopted in T21 areas. But, and this is not surprising, uh, uh, and this is not a threat to the uh, to the, to identification, as we'll see later. Uh, uh, we report the uh, event study analysis, and there would be no problem. So uh, these the, this table provides the estimates of the effect of T twenty one on cigarette use among. 8th and 10th graders using data from monitoring the future survey between 2012 and 18. So the basic, the baseline estimates suggest no effect. However, when we partial out the pre-trends using the Goodman-Bacon approach, we see a slight reduction and a statistically significant reduction in cigarette use uh, in the past 30 days among the 8th and 10th graders students. We do not find any large and significant uh, estimates uh, of the effect of T21 on average daily cigarettes. Uh, when we conduct the event study analysis, uh, we see that probably relying on the basic results is a more is a is a preferred approach actually so therefore we don't we don't see any effect or we see a small effect on the on from the effect of t21 on smoking among eighth and tenth graders as students however looking at the underage 12th 12th graders uh, and studying the effect of T21 on cigarette use, we see statistically significant and relatively large effects of the policy. The baseline estimates, including county and year level data, 
county and year months dummies and all individual and policy level po policy state and local level variables um, suggesting about 2.5 percentage point decline or about 28 and a half percent decline in uh, the smoking participation uh, when we control for when we basically partial out the pre-trend pre using the goodman bacon approach uh, uh, we see similar effect is slightly smaller but not really that uh, different from the baseline estimates again the average daily cigarette smoked basically shows us no significant impact uh, therefore we, we can say okay it's not really heavy users that that are driving the results the second series of results related to e-cigarette use and we don't really find any significant and large effect on the from the effect of t21 on e-cigarette use at the not not at the intensive nor at the extensive margin so that's the case for uh, the underage 12th graders using the data from 2014 and 2018. Uh, again, we don't find really uh, any effect there on the effect of T21 on e-secret use. Sorry, this should be e-secret use. Sorry about that. Uh, we next turn to studying the effect of T21 on different subsamples, including males, females, white non-Hispanics, black non-Hispanic, and Hispanic and other non-Hispanic races. So uh, the effect is driven by basically a reduction in smoking among males and minorities. Uh, we don't find much evidence of the effect on white non-Hispanic, and the effect on females uh, is uh, small relative to the effect on males and is statistically insignificant. Looking at the e-cigarette use, we see a slight increase uh, in white non-Hispanic populations, so just suggesting that probably uh, this population group might substitute e-cigarettes uh, for cigarettes, but again, the uh, the effect is not statistically significant at 5% level, but still the effect is relatively large and meaningful. Uh, now we turn to event study analysis. Uh, in the event study analysis, we replace the T21 policy variable with a, with a series of binary variables which controls the effect of policy for years leading up to the adoption of the policy, four years, three years, two years, and one year prior to the adoption of the policy, and in the first year after adoption of the policy and two plus years. That's the way we define our event study analysis. Um, overall, we find no effect, uh, no pre-existing trend, and no effect post T1, to T21 on eighth and tenth grader students however we find a significant decline post t21 among the underage 12th graders under, underage 12th grader students and relatively flat pre-trend and we also find no evidence of the effect of t21 on e-cigarette use note that we have three years pre-treatment uh, time period, given that our data on e-cigarette use began in 2014 instead of 2012. Well, so I just want, we have about um, 11 minutes left just to keep us on time. Thanks. Sure, definitely. Uh, so this, and this is some sensitivity check analysis. And this analysis helps us to get some information about the uh, treatment heterogeneity. In this analysis, uh, we leave each locality that adopted the T21 at some point in time. 
out of the analysis one by one. So the first one is California, New Jersey, and then New Jersey, Oregon, Massachusetts, Chicago, New York City, Suffolk, Suffolk County, Genesee County, and Cleveland and Columbus. Overall, we see a pretty consistent estimate, and it, this analysis suggests that we our estimated coefficient on T21 did not were not basically driven by a particular uh, locality or state and suggest that we don't, the, the estimated effect is kind of homogenous across all the treated localities. I have one more test suggesting uh, uh, treatment homogeneity, and I'm gonna show it later. So the second series of uh, event studies related to other substances, it's very important to know that, that T20, what kind of effect T21 might have on other substances such as cannabis and alcohol. The literature suggests that, the pre prior literature suggests that probably uh, cannabis and tobacco are complements, so there might be some relationship. And the literature on alcohol is a little bit mixed. Uh, so in this analysis, using studying the effect of T21 on prevalence of cannabis use and alcohol use, we, f we don't really find any evidence that uh, uh, T21 leading to an increase, for example, in cannabis and al or alcohol use. Uh, there might be some decline, but th that decline is ap appearing after the first year, and it's not really statistically significant. Uh, finally, um, as th there are some additional estimation and checks, making sure that our results are not basically random. Our main estimate was negative 0.0246. Uh, in, an, in, an, in an additional analysis, we studied the effect on 12th graders over the age of 18. For this group, the estimated coefficient declines to 0.8 percentage or 0.9 percentage points. And the effect is not statistically significant at conventional levels. Uh, so uh, that might be related to the fact that uh, monitoring the future does not basically survey the dropouts. And overall, we don't see much effect on T21 among those who were already being able to acquire cigarettes through legal channel. Uh, the second uh, analysis is studying the effect of T21 in early years of adoption, meaning that those that adopted the policy between 2014 and 16, and those adopting the policy between 2017 and 18. Uh, the point estimates are, is, are pre pretty similar, 0 0.25 and uh, point, 0.025 and 0 0.021. However, the, uh, late, the late T21s are not really precisely estimated. But the point estimates are pretty uh, similar, suggesting that probably the, our, we don't have the case of treatment heterogeneity in our net, uh, study, basically. Another analysis is about studying the effect of state-level T21 versus local-level T21. Uh, this is also interesting, suggesting a relatively larger effect of state level T21 compared to local T21. Uh, however, the 95% uh, confidence intervals overlap, so we can't really say that are, that they are statistically different. But uh, looking at the point estimate, the point estimate related to a state level T21 is larger compared to the local T21. And the other analysis is related to using a probit regression analysis instead of a linear regression analysis. And here we, rep I, we report the marginal effect from, probit reg from a probit regression. And it's pretty comparable, it's slightly lar larger, but uh, again, in the same range and it's statistically significant. And last, uh, Analysis is related to reporting unweighted estimates. The unweighted estimates of uh, underage 
to 12th grader students is slightly small, uh, smaller and statistically insignificant. And uh, therefore, this, uh, this check suggests that probably in this analysis, we should control for, we should weight the regressions by population weight. And if I wanted to elaborate a little bit more on that, uh, it could be related to the fact that the localities that adopted T21 are mostly localities with high, uh, um, high proportion of population that are Hispanics. And uh, when we do an unweighted regression among the Hispanics, results are pretty comparable with the weighted regressions among his, the Hispanic population. So overall, this check suggests that probably in the in the general analysis, we should control for uh, monitoring the future survey weights. And just to wrap up, in this analysis, we conclude that the T21 reduces cigarette use by about 28.5% among the underage 12th graders. It's uh, consistent with the prior literature uh, in terms of the magnitude of the effect is relatively within, within the same range. The effects are bigger among males and minorities. We find little evidence that T21 is affecting the eighth and 10th graders. And we don't find any effect of e-cigarette use in any group. And we also find no unintended consequences, suggesting that we don't have any effect on T20, of T21 on cannabis and alcohol use, and there's no substitution with, with tobacco in this regard. Uh, thank you, and I'll be happy to respond to any questions or comments. Great, thank you so much, Rahi. Um, we have uh, one question in the Q&A. Uh, this is from Ken Warner. Uh, he'd like your thoughts on what would logically explain an effect on underage 12th graders while finding none in eighth and 10th graders. Same questions about whites versus African Americans and Hispanics, um, and then uh, why these why the study's findings are so different from those of earlier studies. So, if you could speak to that, that would be great. Sure. Uh, first of all, the effect on underage 18 uh, could be driven by the fact that um, this group of population usually get their tobacco and cigarettes. Uh, from the older friends in a school who are above the age of 18. When this age group, when this group of students who are above the age of 18, now they're under the age of, under the T21. So they're not basically being able to purchase cigarettes and e-cigarettes legally anymore. So the access to the underage population, those who are under the age of 18, uh, would be curtailed, and that probably could explain why this population group uh, are going to get affected. And what was the second and the third question? Sorry. Just one second. Um, yeah, I'll just repeat the question. Um, also had some questions about uh, why this study's findings were different from other studies, and a bit about heterogeneity by um, uh, race uh, and ethnicity. Sure. So uh, in terms of different, in terms of the magnitude, um, I guess they are not that different. As I said, the first study was an online survey found an effect of 39% decline. The second study by uh, uh, Friedman and Wu find about around this 30% decline, which is pretty close to what we have, 28.5. Uh, Brian and others, 21 study, the point estimate is about uh, 3.1, I believe. So again, they are not really very different. I, I guess I can categorize them in the, within, the, within the similar range. Uh, and the other question about the uh, effect on minorities, as I said in my, uh, in the robust or additional estimation slide, uh, this policy, these pol T21 policies 
uh, at least by mid 2018, were adopted in localities that had more population of minorities, specifically Hispanics. So that could probably explain uh, why uh, we see some sort of effect. It, it also, it might be related to the fact that the, preva the prevalence of use of e-cigarettes might be different depending on the population group. I have to look into that, but I guess that might be another reason why we see heterogeneous effect by gender, by race, actually. Uh, just a clarifying question from Ken Warner. Um, he thought that the earlier studies found effects for other than just underage 12th graders. That would make sense. That would make this study's findings very different again. And um, uh, maybe he thinks perhaps there's a bit of uh, uh, misunderstanding here on perhaps his yeah, part. Yeah, so got it, got clarify. it. Yeah, I got it. So you're referring to the the, the last point estimate I reported for the 12th graders, 18 and older. Yeah. So uh, comparing our study with uh, uh, Friedman and Wu, uh, they basically look at the Burfus data. Burfus data includes all sorts of population group above the age of 18, between the age of 18 and 20. So we are looking at only those who are in high school. So we, as I said, one of the drawbacks of uh, monitoring the future survey is that is that they don't follow up with the dropouts so that could be one of the reasons uh, and also on the other hand our data is more recent uh, uh, friedman and who includes data from 2011 2016 which uh, six, 2016 is the year that several other states or localities adopted the policy so that might be related to um, this differences in terms of the time period of a study of the analysis. But the studies are not perfectly similar in terms of time period, but methodologically they are similar. But the time period of a study and the, potentially the target group are different. That's probably why uh, we see some, some sorts of differences. I think we just have one more question um, and then I think we will have cleared the Q&A. Uh, there's a question about, do you have any thoughts and could you share them on why there was an effect of T21 on cigarette use, but no effect of C21, T21 on e-cigarette use among underage 12th graders? Just I think there's looking for yeah. some thoughts. Sure, that's a good question actually. Uh, I see that the paper by Brian and others uh, found effects on, on e-cigarettes, but uh, basically that's what the uh, monitoring the future survey tells us. But if you want to justify these findings, I would say access to e-cigarettes is relatively easier to the underage population compared to conventional cigarettes. And this is something that is basically discussed in the literature and basically this pr proposed by different surveys. For example, um, about 85% of uh, adolescents report that they have it's easy for them to get cigarettes. Uh, sorry, uh, seventy-five percent reports that it's easy for them to get cigarettes, while eighty-five percent of people of the adolescents report that it's easy for them to access e-cigarettes. So that might be the reason behind this results that we get finding almost no effect of the effect of T21 on um, e-cigarette use among the underage population. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, we want to thank Dr. Abuk for the presentation and uh, give another thank you to the moderator and the discussants for their hard work today. Um, our next seminar speaker will be Dr. Kimberly Sterling, who's giving a Grand Rounds format presentation on May 13th, titled The Measure of Little Cigar and Cigarillo Use, the Assessment of Tobacco Regulatory Policies Using Discrete Choice Experiments. You can register into a, in a link in the chat. Um, also, the Food and uh, uh, Law Drug Institute uh, sponsored nicotine and addiction seminar starts in one hour. Uh, it's titled Understanding Nicotine, Health Impacts, Public Misperceptions, and Improving Education. Uh, 
Uh, and after leaving the seminar, you will have an opportunity to complete a survey on your satisfaction with the seminar today. We appreciate the feedback. You will also receive an email with instructions for how you can receive a certificate for your attendance today. Uh, one additional parting announcement for everyone, in a few weeks, uh, TOPS will select presenters for the summer season. So please consider submitting your research for consideration into the TOPS summer session seminar by midnight Eastern Standard Time, May 23rd. Uh, you can find that at tobaccopolicy.org forward slash call. Finally, thank you to the audience of over 130 people for your participation. And thanks again for participating and have a top-snotch weekend.